Um, thank you for joining our session on international AMS opportunities. Uh, we have three excellent speakers uh, and, and um, presentations installed for you today. I've had the pleasure of working with most of them, and I certainly hope you are as, as excited about these presentations as I am. Now, if you intend to tweet or post on social media, don't forget to use our hashtags. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past and present. Just a few housekeeping items before we proceed. Uh, just type your questions in the Q&A section and we'll have an option to ask your questions at the end as well. Uh, we're very lucky to have all our presenters joining from overseas from different time zones. Um, and so you, you will have a chance to ask any burning questions at the end. Okay, so uh, first up is Dr. Celeste Chan. Uh, Celeste holds a medical degree from the National University of Timor-Leste and is the head of pharmacovigilance and control of medicines department in her country. So I'll just close this screen and I'll just share her presentation. Right, Celeste. Thanks, Ron, uh, for the briefly introduction. Good morning from Timor Leste. Uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity, opportunity that's given to me to present uh, in this uh, very important event. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to introduce my name is Celeste Cham. I'm, I'm working in Ministry of Health as a head of of vigilance in control of uh, medicine, and my background is medical doctor. In this morning, I will present you uh, the topic of this presentation is piloting the national antimicrobial prescribing survey at our national hospital, Hidu Baladares. The outline that I will uh, explain you in detail. Uh, is a uh, aim of this uh, method, results, and recommendation. The aim of this activity is uh, a targeted audit of the antimicrobial use in the surgical and internal medicine ward in the National Hospital Guido Valadares to determine the compliance with the treatment guidelines and appropriate of the therapy. And then the second aim is the report, the result to the hospital executive and the antimicrobial stewardship committee in the national hospital and provide the recommendation to improve the quality of prescribing in the future. Okay. The method that used in this uh, activity is uh, the antimicrobial use audit was conducted, conducted on two walls until 30 cases were collected over the one week period and a standardized and internationally recognized tool known as the National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey was used to collect data from the patient, uh, as you know, medica medication chart and medical notes. Data was entered into the NAP online portal to generate the report, including the graph. And the assessment of compliance and appropriateness were made uh, using the hospital antibiotic guidelines 2016, more or less. And now we are in the waiting for approval, the new uh, edition of the antimicrobial guidelines. And the complex cases were discussed with the IMS, IMS expert from Australia. Next, this is the result. Uh, the compliance with the treatment guidelines. Here uh, you can you can see the graph that 41.7% uh, is compliant with the therapeutic guidelines, and 29.2% is not compliant, and 8.3 is direct therapy, 
and no guideline available is 4.2 and the rest is not acceptable. Next. And the appropriateness of therapy in this one is uh, you can uh, you can see here 31.3 is uh, optimal and 12, uh, 12.5 is adequate, 27.1 is suboptimal, inadequate is 10, 10.4%, and the not accessible is 18.8%. And most commonly prescribed antimicrobial here is, uh, you can see uh, ceftriaxone in 19 cases is the uh, with the green, uh, with the green is uh, nine cases with the uh, appropriate, and then eight. Uh, the red one is inappropriate, eight cases, and two cases is not acceptable. And then uh, the second one is metronidazole, is nine cases, uh, six cases is appropriate, and one case is inappropriate, and the red one is not, not acceptable. The third one is cloxacillin with four cases inappropriate and then two cases is uh, not acceptable. And the rest of the you can see it in the screen. Can you? And this so, is the so, most, so, most, um, most uh, common con indication, most, most common indication that uh, found in this uh, NAP audit. Uh, here we can uh, see the peritonitis. We have six cases with uh, appropriate. Uh, and then two cases with inappropriate, and seven cases with the uh, unknown document. Uh, no, it's not documented. Not have a clear, uh, very clear documentation. And the open fracture have a uh, five cases, but four of them is inappropriate. And the rest pneumonia, three cases with appropriate, and two cases with inappropriate. Hyalonephritis, uh, from four cases, found two cases inappropriate and uh, two cases inappropriate. And um, for the uh, most common indication, uh, in peritonitis, peritonitis uh, you can see that uh, the six cases is uh, According compliance, uh, uh, compliance with the guidelines, but the two cases is uh, some of this is because of the the use um, section too narrow, and then uh, uh, some of them is uh, the dose, incorrect dose, and uh, frequency. The documentation of indication is 100% uh, here is uh, all the documentation uh, uh, indication is uh, documented. And the review and the scope documented is 47.9%. And surgical prophylaxis prescription is a uh, very, uh, no, no have any, any surgical prophylaxis because uh, the three cases that I, um, I uh, I did my uh, audit. Uh, all the cases is uh, like when when the patient comes to the emergency, they uh, already uh, start with the with the antibiotic. Uh, after after that, uh, continue with the with the normal uh, normal uh, therapy. Uh, it means that uh, they don't uh, do the the adequate 
uh, prophylactic surgical because of the because of the uh, the the cases it needs to be uh, it needs to uh, put the antibiotic like a fracture open fracture uh, in the cases of accident they don't wait till uh, uh, in, uh, except the elective uh, surgical they put the prophylactic for the uh, antibiotic. Ron, can you, because I don't, I cannot uh, uh, see my slide through in the back. The result forty one point seven of antimicrobial pesticides complying with the guidelines and thirty seven point five were inappropriate. Uh, in this case, um, the medical work performed better than surgical because of uh, the antimicrobial service committee uh, was in. Uh, the lead of the antimicrobial therapy committee uh, in the internal medicine by uh, Dr. Felix. That was the medical uh, war is performing uh, in better than uh, surgical. Uh, about the sexual zone was inappropriate prescribed for the fractures in COPD because uh, in this case, uh, uh, the fracture is usually we use uh, according to our uh, Guidelines we use a uh, clock of clean, but uh, some of the the result is with uh, use perfect to to uh, uh, to treat uh, the fracture. That's why uh, it's inappropriate in this case. And high number of cases could not be accessed because of inadequate information for the documentation. And limited limitation of the time and clinical skill also, and and then we have uh, the previous class that uh, conduct by uh, our previous uh, Fleming fellow Agatha, but the result is uh, is a little bit uh, uh, different. It's what I uh, found right now is uh, better than before. And the, the recommendation uh, um, the recommendation that uh, proposed to you is uh, develop and publish the IMU surveillance guidelines for the hospital uh, and make the training for the new hospital and conduct the national antimicrobial protection uh, survey at a point prevalence survey in 2003 and repeat in the national hospital if uh, he expands to, to the five regional hospitals and use both IMC and IMU data to establish the hospital IMS program and identify the problem areas for intervention and the feedback to the clinician. And the last ever uh, evaluate new edition of the treatment guidelines and extent of implementation, the adoption, and gather feedback and the topic and topic for the next version. I think this is a recommendation for the for the future.
and then uh, thank you for your attention. I uh, I think uh, this is my first time to conduct the NAP audit in our uh, our national hospital, Giri Baladares. It should be in the referral hospital, but uh, the time is very short. Uh, one month to conduct uh, this uh, NAP. Uh, I when I discuss with a mentor and I, we decide to, to do the piloting in the war in the national hospital because it's, it's close to, to, to me. Uh, the fire referral is very far away from, from our, our, our city. That's why uh, we just start a learning process from uh, this. I think uh, I can, for the next, uh, year I can uh, plan to do uh, more uh, in the in the five referral hospital because uh, the NAP uh, need to be done in there and to uh, to promote the rational use uh, in the future. But uh, from uh, this uh, the result of this uh, uh, this uh, lab, I think uh, I'm very satisfied because uh, I do uh, cross check with the uh, with the all the forms that I feel in before, and then go and uh, make a review uh, review for all the data that uh, that needs to be uh, filled in the form. I need uh, I feel that uh, I'm very uh, happy because uh, mostly uh, the result of this, uh, this map is uh, 40, uh, as, as I mentioned before, 41.7 is complying with the guidelines. It means that our uh, clinician, uh, even uh, we don't do uh, like uh, refreshing training regularly, but they, uh, they uh, still uh, have knowledge and skills to uh, uh, to uh, to prescribe according to the our compl uh, our our guidelines. That uh, for me is uh, is good, uh, but but uh, some uh, need to be improved uh, more in the future. Uh, that the that uh, needs to be uh, maybe to improve, improve better, uh, take a capacity building to them uh, to do, uh, uh, to prescribe more uh, rational use in the, in the antimicrobial. Uh, and in this uh, year is uh, our uh, new edition of the antimicrobial guideline will be released soon in this uh, end of this year. Maybe the next year is uh, is planning to do the socialization and dissemination to all the, the clinicians. That's why we need to uh, after the after the the dissemination we need to monitoring what uh, the prescribing or the clinician uh, uh, we need to monitoring them uh, use the the SNAP tool to to uh, to know the to measure the their feeling is still better or not. I think uh, from my side is only this. I'm sorry because my English is not really good to explain you better. But uh, if you have any uh any comment recommendation for for me, is uh, I'm really uh, feel free to to. Thanks, Celeste. Um, so we might have to move on to the next speaker. Um, we'll save any of your questions for the end of the presentation. I think all three of our speakers will be hanging around after. So, okay. Um, next up, we have um, Dr. Atifa Mushtaq. Atifa is a scientific... Sorry, I'll just share my screen again. Hmm.
Yes. So Atifa is a scientific officer in the pharmaceuticals at the National Institute of Health in Islamabad and is a member of the National Policy Advisory Technical Working Group for Antimicrobial Resistance. She's practiced in different healthcare sectors, including as a hospital pharmacist in roles involving dispensing, prescribing, procuring, and quality testing of medicines. Atifa has expressed that the fellowship has impacted her professional development, created meaningful professional networks, improved her understanding of the pharmacist's role, improved her data analysis skills, and provided her the skills necessary to devise strategies and policies to address AMR. Most importantly, she's learned how intersectoral contribution can strengthen surveillance systems to help achieve the objectives of the National Action Plan. So I'll just hand over the, uh, the mic to Ati for now. Hi, Ron, and hi, all. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Good morning from Pakistan. Uh, this is Atifa, and I am a pharmacist by profession. And um, as Ron told you, I'm currently working as a scientist at the National Institute of Health, Islamabad. And I'm working with the Fleming Fund as well uh, as an AMCU surveillance pharmacy of uh, for, uh, surveillance uh, fellow uh, and being mentored by the University of Melbourne. Uh, Fleming Fund is basically a UK aided, funded, and funded project being working in 25 countries, uh, developing countries, including Asian and African countries, uh, to combat the antimicrobial resistance. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work in Awareness Week. Uh, the work I'm going to present and what we are going to discuss in, uh, in the next 15 to 20 minutes is basically about the antimicrobial consumption data analysis in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, Pakistan. Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, we usually abbreviate as KP or KPK because it's too long. KP is one of the fourth province of Pakistan and uh, it is located on the northwestern region. Uh, although it is the smallest uh, province by Pakistan, uh, by land area, but it is the third most uh, largest province uh, by population and cover almost 18% of the total Pakistan population and has the 35 million population. Um, it has seven divisions and 34 districts. As far as the health department is concerned, it has um, an autonomy with all legislative and the financial entity and uh, have their own guiding health policies, governing healthcare institutions, and the leading healthcare interventions. Why I have chosen uh, KPK as uh, to um, uh, analyze the data on it, because in the other two provinces, uh, antimicrobial consumption data and even AMU data, that is point prevalence data, have already been conducted. So you can say this is the first kind of study in this province. The aims are, and objective are basically um, uh, are very basic to calculate the antimicrobial consumption usage trend based on the procurement data to identify the 10 most uh, um, antimicrobial into the public setting hospital. I've taken the public setting hospital because most of the population, like 60 to 70 percent of the population visit the public sector's hospital in KPK due to the affordability reason. Then uh, from this data, we can set a baseline for the antimicrobial consumption into the KPK province. And then we can compare this uh, baseline with the other provinces uh, consumption data as well. The next, the, the data source, as I've told you that I've taken the public sector procurement and um, data uh, from the Director General Health Services, KPK, that has the mandate of the procurement of all the, all the medicine, including antibiotic, and have um, and, uh, they purchased is centralized for all the hospital into the KPK through a software called as the Procurement Management Information Software, PROMESH. Before this, I've decided to take the hospital data because that is more reliable, but because in hospital, there is manual entries into the registers and uh, ledgers, and it was really time taking. So I shifted my focus from uh, hospital data to the consumption data, to the procurement data, sorry. Uh, the data covers uh, two years, 2019 and the 2020, and it reflects the data from all the tertiary and the secondary care hospital um, from KPK. In KP, the hospitals are basically categorized into the A, B, C, and D category. 
category A include uh, medical teaching institutes, non-medical teaching institute, and the specialized uh, hospital that account for almost 38 of the total hospital. Then category B include district headquarter hospital. Category C include 78 Tassil headquarter hospital. Uh, the basic difference, if I can tell you, category B and the C, because district headquarter hospital are much larger as compared to the Tassil headquarter hospital. Every district like have uh, three or four Tassils in it. So the um, district headquarter hospital consists of minimum th 300 bedded hospital, while Tassil headquarter hospital consists of 150 bedded hospital according to the population of that area. Then category D hospital, uh, these are not hospital, you can say these are the small rural healthcare centers and uh, uh, there are the 111 rural healthcare centers in um, KPK. Along with this, there are the uh, few vertical programs and the integrated programs as well. Um, the characteristic of my data, it covers uh, whole KPK province and like many other lower middle income countries, we also lack a sophisticated or, or an official data base for the collection of uh, the sales uh, figures and the prescription figures as well. So I've taken the procure procurement data as a proxy for the consumption monitoring. The data covers include uh, like uh, 380 hospital over the years 2019 and the 2020 and all the antimicrobial whether they are the syst uh, for the systematic use uh, systemic use or for the local use um, skin uh, vaginal infection or for uh, ear uh, so they are taken for the analysis and then monitored methodology was um, it, it is a, rest, a retrospective data uh, of 2019 to 2020 excel based analysis was done and uh, defined daily dose was cal calculated according to the standardized who procedure according to the route of their administration with atc coding up to the five levels and the updated version of the 2021 was used this data uh, analysis was used to calculate uh, did that is um, basically uh, defined daily dose per thousand inhibitant per day then total consumption uh, of the antibiotic uh, we have i have classified it into the who aware category and then uh, their relative consumption um, of antibiotic as percentage of total consumption by the 10 most uh, by the 10 most uh, antimicrobial used um, i have taken only the oral and the parenteral because uh, ddd for uh, topical was not included in the who listed so these all uh, uh, were uh, calculated according to the estimated population of the KP. Coming to the results, um, as you can see, there is a clear difference uh, and, and there is a drastic decrease into the consumption of the antibiotic into the 2020. We can relate uh, this um, uh, into, uh, from, uh, with, with the COVID because 2020 is a COVID year and uh, uh, and the reason for being so less consumption of the antibiotic because most of the uh, because the hospital visits were much reduced in that year uh, all the because this is a public sector hospital uh, public sector hospital data so most of the public sector hospital have closed their uh, opd and all the wards only the emergency and the uh, covid wards was open at that at that time so the visits were greatly reduced and uh, in addition to these, there were the decreased number of the prescription into the community care as well. And uh, there were a the few prescription for the mild and the self-limiting diseases, um, like you can say sore and, and the fever and the upper th and uh, flu. So uh, there was uh, less prescription as well. And uh, in addition to that, we could not forget the NPIs uh, that are the non um, that non pharmaceutical intervention, um, including the physical uh, distancing. Uh, respiratory etiquette, face use of the face mask and the promotion of the hand hy hygiene and the other infection prevention control practices. And definitely these all factors contribute to the less consumption of the antibiotic in the COVID time. Then again, um, coming to the top 10 antimicrobial used in 2019 and the 2020, again, you can see that um, uh, all the antibiotic uh, um, are, um, are less used in 2020, except two, that is the amoxicillin and the metronidazole. Uh, amoxicillin, clovalonic acid, and the metronidazole. Amoxicillin and the clovalonic acid is, uh, use, uh, increased use is justified as it most, uh, mostly used in the upper respiratory tract infection. 
while if we, if we talk about the metronidazole because metronidazole is a kind of you can say over the counter drug uh, used in pakistan it is used along with every other antibiotic used in pakistan and used to treat stomach ulcers and many uh, uh, and the intestinal ulcers and used to treat a variety of infection Along with this, there were the certain guidelines and national guidelines uh, that were in line uh, with the international guidelines um, were established to suppress the use of the antibiotic for prophylaxis or the treatment with the patient with the mild or the moderate infection or, um, without a suspicion of the bacterial infections as well. So that contributed also contributed to the low use of the antimicrobials during 2020. Consumption, uh, coming to the consumption of the antimicrobial uh, for systemic use by the AWARE category, uh, WHO has classified the antibiotic um, according to this AWARE category, that is the excess watch reserve and the not recommended category. Basically, uh, in access medicine, there are uh, in, in access category to include antibiotic of the choice of, uh, most, uh, of uh, 25 most common infection. So if we see the analysis, uh, there is an uh, uh, like 32 percent of the antibiotic uh, were used from the excess category in 2019 as compared to the 70 percent of the antibiotic in 2020. And I think that is a good figure uh, in 2020 um, and um, really compliant with the WHO guidelines because WHO guidelines say that at least 60 percent of the medicines must be used from the excess category. And uh, if we watch onto the, uh, if we look onto the watch category that are the highest priority and have an increase, uh, uh, that have an increased potential of the resistance. So in uh, 19, uh, in 2019, 67% of the antibiotic were used from the watch category as compared to the, that of the 28% of the medicines are used, uh, antibiotic are used from and the watch category in 2020. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I, I haven't mentioned reserve category because the it is too minimal uh, to uh, show that into the um, uh, into the graphs. And the reason for too uh, low use of the reserve is because most of the medicine in Pakistan is procured because it's a public sector uh, data, and most of the medicine in Pakistan is procured through the is uh, through the tenders and the financial bid bidding. And in in this case. Uh, the reserve medicine are, are much uh, expensive and therefore they don't prefer uh, like cholestin and the imipenem so uh, the less quantity of the reserve medicine is used but on the other side if you look onto the not recommended category there is an increased use of the not recommended uh, medicine in 2020 and it increased from 1.73 to 2.74 uh, in 2020 and uh, uh, the reason uh, of, uh, for this is because most uh, because in pakistan combination drugs are, are much higher use and um, even during covid as well and the combination most of the combination drugs falls into the not recommended category and uh, during covid there uh, like uh, you um, the not recommended category drugs combination drugs like amoxicillin flucloxacin are mostly used cefepirazine solbactam are used in the surgical procedure so that is the reason of high use of the uh, not recommended category during 2020 and total did as evident from the last graph there is an increased use. Uh, uh, the DAD is a much increase in case of the watch category for uh, 2019 as compared to that of the uh, uh, 2020. And I think that is uh, that is a huge concern regarding its potential role and its growing AMR crisis in Pakistan. And we should consider it uh, on a priority. Coming to the discussion, this. Uh, um, Graph give us an insight basically on the COVID-19 pandemic imp impact on the use of the antibiotic as it shows that most of the antibiotic showed a major decline into the consumption into the consumption in the pre-COVID uh, year 2019, mabendazole and the fluoroquinolone and the cephalosporins were mostly used. Let me tell you why mabendazole quantity is too high into the graphs in 2019 because mabendazole in 
uh, here is used uh, mostly uh, is given to the schools for the deworming procedure and it is distributed through the integrated program and the lady health visitors to uh, uh, um, uh, lady health visitor to distribute into the schools for children so that's why in, and um, in 2020 due to the smart lockdown the many other reasons school schools were closed at that time so the banda zone procurement was uh, was very low at that time <clears throat> Uh, in, 20, in 2019, again, 31% of the antimicrobial was used from the access category as compared to 2020. And that basically attributes to the closing of all OPDs and the other wards except the emergency. Earlier in the pandemic and before even starting my uh, uh, my analysis, I was of the view that the erythromycin must uh, fall into the uh, like one uh, in the top uh, in the top three antimicrobial uh, use. But once I've analyzed the data, erythromycin fall into the almost ninth uh, at the ninth position in the top ten category. And when I when like uh, uh, coming to the reason of this, because uh, in the public uh, the erythromycin, azithromycin is basically one of the drug uh, one of the three drug of the choice for xdr typhoid in pakistan all the other uh, um, uh, the first choice drugs like uh, uh, cephalosporin and the ciprofloxacin have become resistance uh, in pakistan so in public sector hospital it's the uh, its use was restricted on the other hand if i have taken the community pharmacy data then definitely the azithromycin use was much higher as compared to this analysis Although the latest studies show that the zithromycin did not show a substantial effect um, for the time recovery and little evidence on the admission of hospital. Basically, these findings have an important anti antibiotic stewardship implication during the pandemic as inappropriate use of the antibiotic lead to the increased antimicrobial usage during 2019. And uh, although, and I I feel that it is still unclear that reduced antimicrobial uh, consumption was stained during 2021 or not. So, and what implication basically it have on the antimicrobial resistance. Therefore, the robust uh, surveillance system, I think, is vital uh, to monitor the situation uh, on, uh, on the yearly basis as well. Challenges and the limitations. Again, there were certain COVID-19 restrictions at that time manual data uh, the, um, uh, the private hospital do have the electronic system but in pakistan public sector hospital because these are the large hospitals they don't have that kind of electronic system to get the data on a single click then time limitation uh, because uh, the work plan was again shortened from the 12 uh, month to the ninth month so that is the reason i can just collect a uh, two-year data input and the output uh, obd could not be calculated then, uh, because we are using certain combination drugs as well, so um, uh, the um, DDD uh, of the combination drug in the WHO list has not been defined, so that could not be analyzed. And then the recent flood had made it difficult for me, because before that we have uh, decided with our mentors that I will just narrow down the data to the seven divisions, but then again the health department got busy into those uh, affectees area. That's why I could not collect. Then again, uh, national AMC data has not been submitted to the WHO class. Um, up till now, no antimicrobial consumption data has been submitted, but antimicrobial resistance data from the different surveillance sites has been submitted to the class. Um, a software called the Pyrant Pakistan Integrated Management System is working, but that is only collecting the data, uh, import data for the antimicrobial consumption and is in the process of connecting with the different hospital to collecting the uh, to uh, connecting to collecting the data uh, that is used at the wards and the different um, hospital at the pharmacy, but uh, the things are still in progress. We can use uh, this data for raising the awareness, and I think that this is the first step, you can say, because there is a dire need of awareness as well. Um, as you see in the case of the COVID, and awareness have created a decrease into the um, uh, use of the antibiotic. Uh, these NPIs have contributed a lot and uh, have supported a lot in uh, combating this uh, AMR. We can inform uh, inform the policy makers to initiate the changes uh, for the rational use of the drug. Uh, can identify the area of the improvement. Uh, we can uh, monitor then monitor the impact of these interventions. Uh, the target where to improve, uh, how to improve the our procurement system and the other systems. Uh, disseminate the results to the stakeholders. 
these are the few recommendations for the future step. We can um, strengthen the national and the provincial system, develop an AM, AMC surveillance system at the provincial level, uh, can um, allow the benchmarking between the different provinces, rural versus urban areas, between, uh, between the different tertiary care hospitals and the secondary, hosp secondary hospitals, then link the data to the different one health uh, approach to monitor the AMR surveillance, uh, conducting um, antimicrobial use surveillance in the hospital to understand the high consumption. Then um, there should be a series of online training program to, uh, to strengthen the antimicrobial stewardship program because antimicrobial stewardship program is still working into the different private care, private setting hospitals in Pakistan. We can just bring uh, this set up to in uh, set up in public sectors hospital. Um, although I know uh, because for the accurate uh, data analysis, PP uh, for AMU for the point prevalence surveillance is is the more accurate data because the, the more we closer uh, to get the data accuracy, the more uh, laborious and the data collection become more um, become more difficult. So uh, and it eventually it requires more resources and the time as well. Uh, and I do have a shortage of time. Um, and because this is a fellowship and we can definitely pro, uh, pro, proceed it after the fellowship as well. Uh, and uh, and I know to achieve the, all these kind of uh, uh, valid results, uh, we have to combine many other data resources into these like community pharmacy data, um, um, uh, import data as well to get a holistic, uh, you can say, view of the consumption. And uh, this is all from me. Thank you so much. And I would really like to uh, thanks and express my gratitude to my mentors who have helped me a lot in this and reviewing my all data and uh, analysis. Thank you again. I'm ready for, uh, for any question and answers. Thanks, Satifa. Uh, I'd like to save the questions to the end again. Um, if, if you can hang around. I'll just um, screen. All right. Okay, uh, so last up is Dr. Pem Chuki. Uh, Pem is a medical doctor with an MD in clinical pharmacology. She's the antimicrobial stewardship lead in Bhutan and a technical expert panelist for drug evaluation for the WHO. So welcome, Pem. Thank you, Ron. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good evening for all the panelists and attendees from different uh, part of the world. And uh, before I begin my presentation, I would like to wish everyone, uh, I don't know whether to call it happy Antimicro Awareness Week, but for us as a uh, AMR combaters, I think it is a happy uh, thing because this is the only time we get to Provo uh, promote advocacy and awareness among the healthcare staffs, public, and even other category of uh, uh, health, such as veterinarians, plant, and et cetera. So with that, uh, I would like to begin my presentation. Uh, hi, Ron, is it visible? Yes. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Okay. So uh, my topic is a bit uh, different from um, my two fellows. Uh, uh, and I I think because the findings are very similar with what uh, Atifa and uh, Celeste has presented. And it is also a lot of uh, recommendations are very similar throughout the country. And with that, I would also like to thank uh, Dohoti and NCAS, especially for supporting Fleming, uh, Fleming Fellowship and being a very useful mentor for all of us. And just be before I begin my presentation, I would like to comment on what Celeste has done with the National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey using the NAPS tool from NCAS. This is one of the most wonderful tools that I've seen because I, I have tried doing uh, the surveys for antimicrobial use in the hospitals with different tools, uh, even from the WHO using their protocol and even the global PPS. But the most interesting part of this NAPS was you do the audit in the morning, you get your preliminary analysis by the end of the day. So this was really fantastic and really resourceful and helpful, especially for country like ours, where we do not have lots of expertise who can do an analysis, 
go into detail. So I just wanted to add that to what Celeste had, had presented. And with that, uh, I would present my presentation, which is early efforts of antimicrobial stewardship in Bhutan. And again, before I go to the main topic, I would like to declare this antimicrobial stewardship in Bhutan has been a success, again, due to NCAS, because I had this first visit in 2017 in NCAS, where I was amazed by the stewardship activity happening in Royal Melbourne Health Hospital with the support from NCAS. And that is how we started antimicrobial stewardship in Bhutan, even before Fleming Fund came into the picture. So I would like to again thank uh, NCAS for the whole uh, journey of stewardship in Bhutan. So as uh, introduction, many of us attending here will are aware of, about the whole introduction that I'm going to present, but nevertheless, I would like to again emphasize as we know, nearly half of the hospitalized patients receive antimicrobial, and it has been proven with different point prevalence sur surveys conducted in different hospitals in different world. And most of the important points uh, are that trivial viral infections or those infections which actually does not necessarily need an antibiotic are being treated with antibiotics. There is a lot of lack of basic principles of antimicrobial therapy, and that I uh, would like to emphasize that in Bhutan, uh, this is one of the reasons that a lot of antibiotic irrational prescription is happening. There is, and there are a lot of physicians who are under the pressure for short-term resol resolutions, especially in the outpatient department, there are a lot of demands from the patients saying they need, uh, very specifically, they would say, I need an amoxicillin. That's the only thing they know. And they would say that I need that for my common cold to go early to my work or, you know, to get better, to do some other activities. So these are a few influences that make uh, inappropriate antibiotic use quite common in the country. Uh, fortunately, in Bhutan, we do not have any pharma pharmaceutical companies, but we can see uh, many, many of our trainers get trained in other part of the world, like either in Bangkok or in India, where they have seen a lot of pharmaceutical influence to promote their antibiotic use. And that is one way that the irrational uh, prescription of antibiotics is happening. As we know, misuse of antibiotics happen in different platforms. And uh, these are a few things that uh, that 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 leads to misuse. Uh, like I already mentioned, antibiotics will be prescribed when it is not indicated, and many people think that antimicrobial stewardship is to stop using antibiotics. But I would like to emphasize that it is not only to stop using irrational antibiotics, but also to make sure that the right patient gets the right antibiotic at the right time. So example, the sepsis, when a critically septic patient is sepsis, a septic shock comes, antimicrobial stewardship also monitors or even uh, pro provide advocacy that the right antibiotic should be given at the right time. So stewardship also plays a role in that because in Bhutan, many of the physicians or the healthcare staff feels that, oh, they are here to stop the antibiotics, or oh, they're here to monitor, you know, so they feel that we are an obstacle not to start, but I wanted to emphasize that stewardship also makes sure that the right patient gets the right antibiotic. And what is worrisome, and especially globally is, as we all know, the pharmaceutical companies are drying up. Man, many antibiotics are not, new antibiotics are not being manufactured or even being invented. So, and they're going to now more into alternatives of antibiotics. So all these cost to the uh, economic, it has a lot of impact on the cost to the economy of a country. And still the infectious disease is one of the most common cause of death in many of the countries, especially in low middle income country, either due to access, not having a good access to the antibiotics, which is required, or being or, or counterfeit antibiotics being uh, supplied to the country. So these are all some other reasons that leads to all this mortality and morbidity in a country like uh, ours. And um, We've been talking earlier that uh, antibiotic discovery and all, but we have to keep in mind now we are all living in the post-antibiotic era and we need to do something together before things become really worse. With that, um, 
before I go to uh, my uh, AMS in Bhutan topic, I wanted to emphasize that every hospital or institute should have a policy or standard operating procedure, which is practical to their own context. They cannot copy and paste from somewhere and from some hospital and do the same. For example, infectious disease, uh, running an antimicrobial stewardship in a country like ours, where we do not even have a single anti uh, infectious disease is not feasible. And thinking that we do not have an infectious disease physician and AMS cannot be started is, is not the right way to go. So I think we can always adopt and adapt to our own context. For an example, I've seen a lot of uh, publications from NCAS again, where nursing le leading antimicrobial stewardship has shown a good uh, outcome. So it's similar like that in a country where there is no IT physician or there is no clinical pharmacist, you could always think about nurse led antimicrobial stewardship or, or any other healthcare professionals leading antimicrobial stewardship mainly to promote judicious and appropriate use of antimicrobials. And when we have these kind of key performance indicators for the hospital, it promotes and also gives us a platform to bring antimicrobial stewardship as a priority for the country. And with all those, I think Bhutan realized that antimicrobial stewardship is one of the way or the strategy to really promote judicious and rational use of antibiotics in the country. And since then, uh, in 2017, we kicked off the antimicrobial stewardship program in the national hospital. And we were very fortunate in, in by 2019, we got the Fleming Fund grant and very fortunate that we got linked up with NCAS again, and we got all the mentorship, from uh, the experts from Australia. So as we know what is antimicrobial stewardship, it's an activity that includes appropriate selection, dosing, route, and duration of an anti antimicrobial therapy. It again promotes judicial use and has a major role also in education and providing advocacy not only to the uh, healthcare staffs but also to the publics and other healthcare staffs like veterinarian healthcare and para vets. Infection control and AMS is one of uh, the uh, are the two programs that have to go hand in hand, and I'm quite uh, happy to say that in Bhutan, our infection control program and the antimicrobial stewardship program goes hand in hand, saying that we have the similar committee, we have the similar platform to discuss things with regard to combating AMR. Goals of AMS, as we know, is to mainly primarily to optimize the clinical outcomes and minimize the adverse effects such as toxicity uh, or other, other uh, side effects such as, and also the emergence of uh, AMR. Secondary goal is to reduce the healthcare cost by either reducing the number of days uh, admitted or even the types of antibiotics that are being prescribed. And lastly, I think AMS uh, for Bhutan, we also take a very important role in, in providing education and creating awareness on AMR and also the, providing the principles of antimicrobial stewardship and its concepts. So for Bhutan to start uh, antimicrobial stewardship and the reason that we have been uh, getting few success in antimicrobial stewardship is Bhutan is one of the member state country of WHO who had agreed to develop our own national action plan, which was launched in 9th May 2017 uh, by the very highest level of uh, uh, policymakers from the national parliament. It aligns very much well with the global action plan to combat AMR, meaning the strategies and the objectives are very similar to what global action plan of WHO uh, dictates. And also, uh, like I already mentioned, it is endorsed by the highest uh, policymakers. The very good thing about National Action Plan of Bhutan is it has a one health approach. And why I say one health approach, I would be uh, describing more in my subsequent slide. And uh, by December 2022, our National Action Plan is expiring. So we have a plan to review our National Action Plan uh, again, and where again, our mentors come into the play to help us develop and review our existing National Action Plan. So why we say we have a one health approach in the country is when we talk about the AMR governance in the country, we have what the highest level committee members are, what we call the Interministry Committee on One Health. And in this, we have two ministry or two ministry stakeholders in play, that is Ministry of Health and Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock. 
from the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock, the very active players are the veterinarians and the uh, food and uh, food regulatories for now in the country. But with the review and uh, revi revision of the National Action Plan, we have a plan to include the environment, health, and wildlife. So we are we have. Only yesterday we had a discussion that we would be involving the environment, health and the wildlife in our national action plan to combat AMR. Uh, just below the interministerial uh, committee of one health we have the national amr technical committee so they are the national amr technical committee who endorses and passes our recommendations from the technical working group and they've put it forward to the imco and that is how policies and uh, guide, guide guidelines are being developed in the country with regard to technical working group we have members both from animal health veterinary health uh, buff, uh, food and uh, food, uh, food regulatories, and from the human health, and uh, also the good thing about the technical working group is all the first cohorts of the Fleming Fund fellowships are a part of the technical working committee. So, a uh, AMS in Bhutan, like I already mentioned, established in 2017 in the National Hospital, which is a 380 bedded hospital, and it's a tertiary care hospital. When we started it, we uh, had uh, AMS committee identified, in, including IPC uh, nurses, laboratory staffs, and also we had put the managerial people on board and few other physicians from different departments, like from surgical department and medical departments. And we also had a small AMS team who could do the day-to-day -day activity of the AMS uh, program in the committee. And all the committee, as well as the AMT, uh, AMS team had a defined terms of reference, which is very important when you want to begin uh, AMS program in the, uh, in the hospital, because everyone needs to know what AMS is going to do and who is responsible for what. So Bhutan was fortunate to start AMS program in the country with a very defined terms of reference. Under the interventions of AMS in Bhutan, AMS was also involved in the development of national antibiotic guideline. This antibiotic guideline was happening uh, since 2007 and it was getting reviewed every five years. So the two guidelines were already, uh, already developed and uh, drafted. Uh, but in 2018, when AMS program uh, initiated, this antibiotic guideline development and revision was given as a uh, activity for the AMS program. So during a, uh, during 2018, the guideline looks very different from what it was earlier because it is more based on our antibiogram and also it is based on many other additional points like involving many other physicians in taking the ownership of the uh, guideline. So this is a bit of difference from what it was happening earlier in 20, 2007 till 2018. And this is again because AMS took the ownership of developing the National Antibiotic Guideline. Oh, with that, even in 2018, the aware classification of WHO came up and we, we were very fortunate to uh, in, incorporate aware classification both in our National Essential Medicine list as well as as well as in our national antibiotic guidelines. So we have our antibiotic prescription guideline based on the aware classification. And we also developed as a very low hanging fruit uh, the surgical prophylaxis standard operating procedure in the hospital. And it was indicated as one of the key performance indicator for the hospital. And most of the surgical uh, prophylaxis SOP was taken ownership by the surgical department. So as for the other interventions of antimicrobial stewardship, we conducted prospective audit and it was twice a year in 2018 and 2019, but then the pandemic happened and somehow AMS activity really got uh, diluted because the priority was more into the pandemic combating. And as you know, in Bhutan, we are very limited experts. So we were all uh, directed for other responsibility. For example, myself, I took the managerial responsibility and also the core lead uh, to, uh, for the clinical management of COVID in the country. So due to all that, AMS really got diluted in the process of combating the pa pa pandemic. 
uh, in Bhutan, uh, we also have the formula restriction where we say higher generation antibiotics cannot be given directly without getting a prior approval. And in this, we have three members who give the approval. One is uh, the clinical microbiologist, one is the head of department of pharmacy, and one is myself as an AMS lead in the hospital. So either two of us have to review the prescription and then give the approval. And also the antibiotic timeout, especially for emergency cases where they need higher generation antibiotics for sepsis with septic shock, we allow them to issue for the first 72 hours and then get reviewed. We have also been successful in de-escalating from parenteral to oral and also from microbiology results, de-escalating from higher to lower generation. And through AMS, we were also able to establish the therapeutic drug monitoring in the national hospital to mainly dose optimize uh, for the patients who are on renal transplant or patients getting the hemodialysis or with acute uh, liver injury. So I'm sure many of you uh, are aware about the AWARE classification of WHO. And uh, Bhutan has adopted this in our national essential medicine list, as, as well as the national antibiotic guideline. And also we have an uh, indicator which is defined by WHO that by 2023, our antimicrobial consumption in the country should be 60% of the access group. So this really helps us to monitor our antibiotics and show whether we are performing good or not. So as we know, access group uh, it are the groups of antibiotics which are mainly used for the first, or uh, mainly used as the first or second choice of antibiotics for many common infections such as pneumonia or urinary tract infections or skin and soft tissue infections. The watch group of antibiotics are those which we can wait and watch, which means that we start the antibiotic from the access group. And if it doesn't improve within 48 hours, we can escalate to a watch group of antibiotics. And for Bhutan, like WHO just mentions, either ceftraxone can be in access or watch. For Bhutan, ceftraxone is a watch group of antibiotics. So we do not want um, for ceftraxone to be the first line of antibiotic for many of the common infections, especially for community acquired pneumonia with mild infections. And also the macroloids are uh, in the watch category in Bhutan. Uh, with regard to meropenem, peperacillin, tazobactam, uh, they, they are also in the watch category, but we are putting them above watch category, but not in the reserve category. The only antibiotic in uh, Bhutan which comes under the reserve category is polymyxine and cholestine, for which we definitely need either a culture report or definitely need a very strong uh, reasons for the recommendations of these uh, highly toxic antibiotics in the country. So with regard to antimicrobial use surveillance, again, point prevalence survey, like I already mentioned uh, in Bhutan, we had started this since 2017, but whatever we collected, we could not really make sense of a lot of things because we did not have a good tool. But from 2019, we, we were exposed to the National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey tool from NCAS, and we used that. And since then, we have been uh, generating our reports, which has been very useful. Surgical prophylaxis audits are also happening uh, in the country. But again, we have some reservations with those. And in future, we are planning to use the SNAPs from the NAPs and uh, see how it works for the country. Prospective audit data collection, analysis, and sensitization to the healthcare workers. So the prospective audit data, mainly we are focused on the antimicrobial consumption in the hospital level. So for that, we haven't really been suc successful in developing a system. But uh, with some uh, institute like Captura coming into play, we are hoping that we will come up with a system to develop the antimicrobial consumption at hospital level. And lastly, the guideline compliance again. Uh, the point prevalence surveys, I'm sure many of us know that it's a snapshot and in Bhutan we do twice a year just to capture the seasonal variation. There are various uh, protocols available like the WHO PPS protocol is there, the global PPS is there and I've looked at and tried all the types of uh, protocols and uh, tried collecting them. But like I mentioned, National Antimicrobial Prescription Survey from Australia has been very useful and has been really helped us to come up with our analysis and recommendations. So when we do the prospective audits, apart from the point prevalence survey, we have very few things which are 
basically more of a quality indicators. So we look at whether there are documentation of indications and many of the audits we have found that the documenting of an indication is lacking in the country. Culture of sending a culture is lacking and allergy mismatch or even the taking of a good allergy history is lacking in the country. So these are some of the quality indicators Bhutan has recommended to the highest policymakers that we need to do something about it. There are mismatch between drug and drug, like when there are culture reports are available, there is no de-escalation or change in the therapy. And for Bhutan, uh, like I mentioned, the surgical prophylaxis, for now what we are auditing is the, uh, uh, the initiation of the antibiotic and not the duration. So we want to make sure the initiation of antibiotic within, is within the uh, accepted time period, which is which is said 60 minutes or two hours from the incision. So we are monitoring that in the country. And the next step now is to look at the whole package as initiation and the duration of surgical prophylaxis in the hospital. Uh, like I mentioned, Bhutan has also been very lucky to be one of the pilot countries involved in the WHO AMS toolkit, where we could find what are the enablers in the country and what are the barriers. And in my subsequent slide, I will talk a little bit on that. There were a lot of expert visits to Bhutan from various countries, from uh, America, from Detroit, from Nepal, from uh, India, and also, of course, from Australia with regard to AMS. And we have a lot of collaborations and technical support. Uh, many, uh, I would like to acknowledge, lots of organization has been involved in strengthening the antimicrobial stewardship in the national hospital, starting from WHO plus Fleming Fund, the Hoti Institute in CAS, and also the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. We have been successfully able to expand the antimicrobial stewardship in the other two regional referral hospitals, and we have some barriers and facilitators also identified, which I would explain more. So just for people who are not aware about the WHO toolkit, so there is a toolkit available freely from the WHO website, and it focuses more on if you want to start a stewardship in an institute, what are the prior requirements, requisites are required. So it helps you put things in place just to just before you kick off a stewardship activity or program in the hospital or even at the national level. Uh, again, Bhutan was very fortunate to be, again, one of the pilot country to do the situation analysis using the policy guidance from WHO, which just came out in 2021. And there we found a lot of good things that why stewardship could a kickoff in Bhutan and could also be expanded to other two hospitals where they look at few core parameters, like example, whether there is a leadership commitment. And in Bhutan, as we have our national action plan and antimicrobial stewardship has been given a prior as in the national action plan, which shows a leadership commitment, accountability and responsibility. Like I mentioned, we have defined terms of reference with people identified. AMS actions, we have our work plan mentioned for the AMS and education and training. We have been doing some training of the trainers in the country, but we are trying to uh, now incorporate AMS principles and concepts in pre-service and in-service curriculum with discussion with the university in the country. We do monitoring and surveillance. Uh, as we know, AMC is being submitted to the class AMC platform and PPS using the NAPS also we are submitting. And lastly, reporting and feedback as we have a very defined structured AMR governance, we have a very regular reporting and monitoring of AMR activity. Uh, so the lessons learned with all this is whenever you're starting or implementing antimicrobial stewardship uh, program in the hospital, you need to have a well-documented uh, stewardship program or strategy with clear terms of reference. And many of the, our country, uh, a country like ours, uh, lack lack in uh, AMS competency. So there are many uh, uh, institute which helps in building on the comp competency, like all, I already mentioned, NCAS, WHO also has some collaborating centers where they can also help you promote or, promote or provide the competency training. And uh, there needs to be written health uh, hospital policies to make sure that the prescribers document their indications. And this is something that we are lacking is the AMS assessment activity or the impact of AMS in the hospital. But uh, with time, we are moving towards the impact 
<clears throat> assessment. And lastly, uh, during the pandemic, we found that, uh, like I mentioned, the AMS was really diluted. So it's always important for every pandemic, be it COVID or may maybe some new uh, tropical disease or any uh, new uh, pandemic coming, that AMS has to be put into that to combat any kind of pandemic. And these are few findings from our feasibility study. The enablers were mainly, like I mentioned, the National Action Plan giving it the priority with clear terms of reference. We had a defined budget allocated for AMS activity. And again, we were very fortunate with the Fleming Fund coming into play that we could move much more forward. With the regulations and guidelines, antibiotics is only sold or dispensed depends on prescription, so it's not over the counter. And we have a very, uh, we were very fortunate to integrate a wire classification in, in our national antibiotic guideline and essential medicine list. We do conduct a periodic CME for the healthcare staff. So initially we started doing six monthly, but with the pandemic, we couldn't. But again, we have kicked off. And very recently, before the awareness, we, we just did the uh, CME for many of the healthcare staffs involving the veterinary and healthcare staffs. Uh, for supporting technologies and data collection, like I mentioned, uh, WHO has a platform for HUNET for the glass AMR data, as well as the AMC data. And WHO is also coming up with the PPS tool. But for now, we are using the NAPS and collecting our data. A few barriers have been seen, uh, like we mentioned, there is a lot of uh, AMS uh, uh, competency lack in the country, and we have a plan to train different categories of healthcare staffs on AMS principles, and the compliance to the guidelines is found quite poor in the country, and we need to also or create more awareness among the publics, and lastly, a lot of uh, laboratory and IT supports is required to collate all the data together and come out with a very good report. So with that, a uh, few way forward recommendations we have is training of AMS competency, in incorporating AMS principles in the pre and in-service curriculums with the university. We also want to develop an AMS guideline and using the WHO tool once it is out for the PPS and also to have some kind of guidance on how to do a AMS impact uh, analysis and incorporating uh, a one health approach data from both AMR and AMU AMC data from both human and animal health. And lastly, uh, we really need to have a regional network of AMS within our own region that is the zero. With that, uh, I have been liking this proverb. Uh, people say talk about this: think globally and act locally to prevent AMR together. Tashi the lake and thank you. With that, I end my presentation. If there are any queries, I'm happy to take. Thanks, Pam. It's a really good presentation. Um, I had a whole bunch of questions I was going to save for the end, but I think you've answered a lot of them. <laughs> now, um, just before I forget, um, Susan Liu, who's one of the AMC and U mentors, was going to hang around to say a few words, um, but she unfortunately had to leave for another meeting. So I'll just read something on her behalf. She wanted to thank the fellows for their collaboration and hard work in collecting AMC and NU surveillance data and is looking forward to using these data to develop AMS training programs in planning fund phase two fellowships. Okay, so um, we are over time now, but I, I believe we've got maybe five minutes we could possibly use for questions. Um, does can, anyone I just, can, can I just have a word, Ron? Yeah, um, sure. I mean, I had the opportunity to meet Pam. How many years ago was it now, Pam? In 2017. So 2017, so five years ago, when Pem first came and met us at the Doherty and came across, she was in, a, in, a, in an incredibly interesting country with widely diverse hospitals that are due, sort of by crow flies, not very far apart, but you have to get to by foot, with very under-resourced, no resource. Um, there are you know, amazing people, but they just didn't have the training required or education and knowledge on how to undertake the um, and address their national action plan. So it is actually, you know, what Pam has presented today has been actually a massive amount of work. And, but it is really heartening to me to see what you've been able to pull together. And um, I definitely know that it's been a big team effort. Uh, and the veterinary guys have been doing uh, equally uh, uh, equal amount of work. We haven't seen the veterinary stuff here, but 
that's also been amazing. So I think the message for me is that, yes, it's, um, it is an absolute challenge to undertake stewardship in a low middle income country, but it actually can happen. And I, and I think it can happen very well. And there are some enablers that in terms of um, what you've been able to achieve that have made it a little easier even than what we have to go through. Because if you, if you, you know, it's a different type of bureaucracy and you can mandate a few more things. And I think Bhutan is unique, isn't it? That all antimicrobials are dispensed out of the hospital system, not out, not out in the community, which is different with that you don't have GPs per se. So everyone has to get antimicrobials in the hospital. But yeah, congratulations. And, and to Tiff and Celeste as well, you know, you guys are on a big journey. But it's really nice to see how how they can get how how far you've been able to get in, in a fairly short period of time. Thanks, Cass. Um, does anyone, any attendee, have any questions for our panel? Since we have a little bit of time, uh, <laughs> Atifa and and um, Celeste, did you want to say some quick words, maybe? three takeaway points for our audience today, maybe things that might have helped you um, implement your AMS program or you know, it, your, do your AMS activities in your hospital or in your country. Just three quick points. Any Anyone? Uh, Ron, okay. so maybe, yeah. Maybe I would like to say, I think AMS is possible in every country despite their resources uh, with a very good support system and getting that from the right people, I think. So uh, as, as many of us already have been mentored from NCAS, uh, we would really like to see many other institutes getting similar support so that we are all in the same platform. If we want to do measure between countries, we know what methodology we have used. We are all aware and we are all on the same platform. So that is something that I wanted to speak. Uh, I wanted to say, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Pam, it's fantastic. Maybe I can speak on your behalf, <laughs> Tifa. And, and uh, so I, I think it takes the right personality and drive to be able to, yeah, to implement this and the right connections. I think if you have the right connections, you, you, you know, you connect with people at a personal level, uh, you know how to speak to people and, and influence. I think that's very important. I think I've seen that in both of you. Um, all right. Um, if no one has any further questions, I'll take this opportunity to thank our speakers today. Um, and really look forward to the work that you'll be producing and we hope to hear from, from more from you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Cass. Thank you, yeah. God. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Thank Ativa. Thanks, Celeste. Bye. Great work, guys. Bye. <laughs>